Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matt from Matt's Bookshelf and today I'm doing a six month wrap up of every book that I've read so far in 2021. I know I usually save this portion for the end of the video, but I just want to say that if you like my content, please make sure to like the videos and comment and subscribe and also check out my friends channels, Colorless Wonderland, formerly Tyler Talks and Dronzo and our movie podcast Film Prods, which is just starting new episodes as well within the past week. So with that being said, let's get into what books I've read in 2021. And to start 2021 off on a bad note, the first two books I read are probably the two worst books that I've read in this year so far. The first one being Second Sleep by Robert Harris. You might not know this book, but Robert Harris is an author that I really like. He wrote a book called Fatherland in the 90s, which I've read twice. And it's one of my favorite books of all time. And it's a dystopian speculative book about what would have happened if the Nazis won in World War II. Very similar to The Man in the High Castle, but Fatherland takes place in Berlin. You follow a, a detective um, working in Berlin, and the way he was able to create this world and the clear amount of research he put into into both like what happened before and also speculating what could have happened if Nazi Germany had won, I found to be very interesting and somewhat grounded and realistic, and again, it's one of my favorite books. So that's why I picked up Second Sleep, because... Again, you know, Robert Harris, he's a good author. He clearly puts a lot of research into the books that he does. However, I cannot recommend Second Sleep. Just as a little background to what the book is about, it it's under the illusion. So this is, this is a big revelation that is revealed in Chapter 1, so I'm going to go into that. I don't recommend reading the book, though, so who cares? And so it's under the, the impression that the book takes place in medieval England. And you follow a priest named Christopher Fairfax as he goes to investigate the death of a um, higher priest in a smaller town. And within like the first couple of chapters, there's a revelation that there are apple products that are being hidden in the, in the priest's in the in the dead priest's uh, stash, like a private stash. And you're like, oh, what, why is there apple products in this medieval town? Turns out it's actually an apocalypse, a post-apocalyptic book. And the whole journey of Chris Fairfax is discovering why the clergy at this time are trying to preach people to not want to to view technology as being a heresy. There's other mysteries as well as to why the priest was killed, but none of this is really explored in a satisfying way because, spoilers for the end of the book, he and his, you know, crew that he, you know, gets together with to unsolve this mystery go into this old university, which would have been existed during our times, but now is like an underground um, to, to bunker, basically, because it's just been buried for, you know, hundreds of years, and they find more technology that... Could be helpful for this for this village but then there's a, a landslide and kills everyone and then nothing is ever really done with this interesting premise and i ultimately really disliked this book because of how flat it ended it felt like it was only getting it to its halfway point where the mudslide happens and kills everyone i guess there's some ambiguity as to whether or not all the characters die the main character and his love interest are trapped in the bunker and they're losing oxygen and it's implied that they're going to die but i could see there being a sequel where they somehow miraculously make it through and this interesting premise is taken to a, a better level, but a more advanced level. But as it stands right now, I have to review the book on its own and it's a complete waste of time. So yeah, not a recommendation for me. Very disappointed in you, Robert Harris. I'm sure you really care. Next up, the other worst book that I read this year and that is Altered Carbon. Um, you might have heard of the Netflix TV show that was you know inspired by this, that was an adaption of this book, but I have not watched the show, but, but I did read the book. And it has a very good premise. It's a, it's a cyberpunk book where death has kind of been conquered by the elites. Basically, you can transfer your consciousness into different bodies, into different like legitimate bodies, and continue to live, albeit in a different body, but you know, still keep your consciousness, your memories, your brain, everything like that. And it kind of creates a very interesting murder mystery because the person at the heart the person who was murdered in this book which is you know the, the premise of the murder mystery is actually still alive he just he transferred his consciousness over and so you follow this man in Takeshi Kofax who himself is a transferred body as he helps this man who is technically who, who was technically murdered but is still very much alive try to find out who murdered him in the first place and also you know try to find this person so they can find out if he'll try to do it again and I was kind of into the book for the first half, but it does something that I don't really like in books where violence is meaningless. Basically, there are instances where Takeshi, who himself is a, you know, a killer, he's uh, he's a former soldier. It's been like a 
six months as I read it, but he's a former soldier and he, you know, kills lots of people. He and like these people are bad and what have you, but he does all these awful things and or like you know criminal things but he just kind of gets away with it and like the cops know he's doing it but it's all kind of just glazed over and it doesn't really have the impact that you think it should and that's kind of where i kind of got detached with the book let alone in addition to the fact that i didn't find all the characters to be very well written and i did appreciate some of the themes it's trying to get across but ultimately it's a forgettable book and i was kind of just skimming through it towards the end because again it just everything felt kind of weightless and without any consequence and I like my detective stories to be a little more um, realistic, to be to have protagonists that can't shoot up a whole building of people and of uh, criminals who can't shoot up a whole building of criminals and get away with it. I like I like you know the girl the shining up two series a lot more things like that. So ultimately, not a recommendation for me. Maybe if you like cyberpunk books, go for it, but I can't recommend it personally. And now we have one of the good books that I read this year, that being uh, Julius Caesar's Civil War. If you don't know this by now, I am a huge Rome, ancient Rome lover. I specifically the Julio Claudian era, that that really amazing time between well, amazing for me reading it retrospectively, but horrible for people living during the time. A really amazing time of the the transition between the Republic to an Empire, and you know spearheaded by Julius Caesar and then his adopted son Augustus, and then further with Tiberius and all that. But this covers Civil War, which was the deciding factor, which is basically like the killing blow to the Republic and, you know, the war between Caesar and the Republic, the war between Caesar and his former friend, former ally, Pompey. And obviously when you read a journal by one of the historical figures themselves, you need to take everything they say with a grain of salt. However, that being said, you do get really interesting insights into how Caesar thinks in this book. And was something you wouldn't really get if you're just reading a historical biography on the man. And also, you know, despite the fact that he clearly has, a, he's clearly an egomaniac in many regards, he also is very reflective and critical of some of his own decisions he made during battles, during the war, of decisions that his com, his um, comrades and his generals made during the Civil War. You know, they had, did suffer some pretty big losses during this time that were unnecessary. And, you know, sometimes praising Pompey for his intellect and for outsmarting Caesar, especially during battles in Pharsalus, it was really fascinating to, to literally be inside Caesar's mind, to understand his thought process. And he's not, the, the, the commentaries are not meant to just besmirch and to slander the Republic and the people who supported it. There is an attempt to write about the battles themselves as object, in a, some sort of objective sense. And his insights on the battle, it's like he's, the way he's able to paint a picture of what was going on and his thoughts and speculating on the thoughts of his enemies all that stuff is really great and i recommend this a lot if you are a fan of ancient rome if you are looking to get into ancient rome as well because this car is a very specific period in history i would say maybe you should have a passing knowledge of what happens during this time period because not all of it's explained to you because he's writing during the time period he just assumes that people reading it know what's going on so it's not like the first thing I would I would recommend reading if you're looking to get into ancient Rome, looking to get into Caesar, but it's definitely something high up there because it's not a particularly long read and just being inside the mind of Caesar is, you know, a pleasure in itself. And now we have The Great Gatsby, written by F. Scott Fitzgerald, probably my favorite author, and this is a reread for me. I would not have reread this book as recently as I did if not for my friend Mark, you know, Ms. Junso, texting me one day saying, Matt, you need to reread this book right now because it's incredible. And he was not wrong. I read this book in high school, and I remember really liking it. But rereading it now with more knowledge of Fitzgerald, having read more of his works, and just being more interested in general in classic literature, The Great Gatsby is as great as they come. It's completely worthy of its venerable status amongst the you know contemporary modernist literature and literature as a whole, and even surpasses the expectations for me personally. It's just so good. I did a review on it. Uh, it's one of my earlier videos. You should check that out. So I'm not going to go too deep into my thoughts on it. But the term book hangover came across to me watching a booktube video now that I'm you know, born to that scene. And which is, if you don't know what a book hangover is, it's when you finish a book and nothing else really compares to it. That is exactly what happened with me and The Great Gatsby. I finished this book and it has one of the best, if not the best last page of writing I've ever read in my life. And... Going to other books after was just like, man, I could be reading The Great Gatsby right now, and I'm not. This book is absolutely incredible. It's much shorter than I remember. It's basically, I mean, it, 
it's not a novella, but it's it's right in that line of being a novella. If you've read it once, I say read it again because it's incredible, and you sort of get a different perspective. You know, if you don't know, knowing what's going on in The Great Gatsby on a reread really changes up what the book is going for. I read it more as a tragedy this time, and it completely works in that regard. It works on two levels, and highly, highly recommend this book is incredible. I will reread it again someday. Not particularly soon because I have a huge TBR on my list, but this book can just be reread on an infinite number of times. Speaking of modernist writers, I have Ernest Hemingway's Sun Also Rises. Also did a video on that, so I'm not going to go too in-depth into my thoughts, but this is my first Ernest Hemingway book that I've read, and man, it is also incredible. I know mean, a lot of hot takes here. Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald are both incredible writers, who would have guessed, but the you know the ability to really write a book where nothing particularly happens but also make that incredibly engaging is you know a feat in itself i really you know go agree with ernest Hemingway's iceberg theory um and you don't have to have flowery prose in order to make an amazing book and the sun also rises is the perfect example of that and also when you're reading it's like you're you're just reading a chapter and you're following Jake Barnes as the main character and he's going to different places in France and then Spain and he's drinking and you kind of get into this repetition of it but then all of a sudden there's just this profound statement made by Hemingway that completely catches you off guard and it makes you think critically of traveling of life of wandering and as someone who loves to travel this book spoke to me on many regards as someone who misses traveling dearly this book was a good escape um, from being, you know, stuck at home for the past year plus. And again, great. If you want to get into Hemingway, I started with this book. I also watched the six hour Ken Burns documentary like two months ago, and that is also incredible as well. And I have Whom the Bell Tolls and A Movable Feast, which I'll be reading hopefully this year. Yeah, def definitely by this year, I would imagine. And yeah, Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, phenomenal, obviously. Hot takes, all that you can expect here on Matt's bookshelf. Next up, I have James Clavell's Noble House. This is my third James Clavell book. Shogun being the first book I read, and one of my favorite books of all time, and also King Rat, which is an incredible book in itself. Noble House did a review on it as well. Check out my review if you want my full thoughts on it. But if there's any evidence that James Clavell is a genius, it's probably this book, mainly in his ability to construct a plot. This book is incredibly complex with so many characters with different motivations, representing different sides of a Cold War conflict in Hong Kong. The financial, the war, the communist versus capitalist war, all that kind of converges into this book. And it has this really weird plot structure where it's just one week in this crazy environment. So even though all the plots are not wrapped up, it's satisfying in a way because you understand that you're just looking at one week in the crazy life of Ian Bartlett, who is the Taipan of Noble House, which is, you know, the, the British leader of this, you know, huge business, huge trading business, and him having to fight all these different adversaries from all these different factions around the world. And it's just amazing how he's able to make this plot make sense and go here and give all the characters the time they deserve. I would say that <laughs> I would say that this is maybe my least favorite of the James Cavell books that I've read, mainly because the plot is so dense that he kind of gets rid of some of the character moments for the sake of, you know, making sure this plot makes sense. But overall, you cannot really get a more complicated plot that's satisfying than a James Clavell book. And it wouldn't be my first Clavell book I'd recommend if you're trying to get into his work. I would say King Rat and Shogun are much, much better. But if you like Clavell, Noble House would be a book that you would enjoy because I enjoyed it immensely. And then we have Ken Follett, A Place Called Freedom. If you don't know who Ken Follett is, he wrote uh, The Pillars of the Earth, which is his most popular book, I would assume. And it follows a Scottish man named Mac during the 17, during the 18th century. He's a miner, and not a miner as a childhood miner as someone with a pickaxe who mines things, and like in Minecraft. And, and he finds out that through Scottish law, which I didn't know at the time, that the people who he's working for, this, this rich aristocratic family who owns the mine, that if he, he's turning 21, and if he works past his 21st birthday, that means he's technically owned by the family. So it's literally slavery. And I don't know how historically correct this is, but the fact that you could own, that there was ownership in the 17th century in Scotland what really interested me and something I did, never really expected to know is that you're technically bound to work for this family when you're young but if you work past your 21st birthday then you're technically owned by them for life so I don't know if that's an actual rule in, in Scotland at the time but I'm assuming that it is and so he, he brings up this news that 
in, in front of like his town and it angers the aristocratic family. And the aristocratic patriarch's daughter, uh, Elizabeth, is that her name? Elizabeth? Yeah, Lizzie. And <laughs> Lizzie. And eventually they, Mac and Lizzie meet and and through a lot of circumstances they come to America and it's very much a Ken Follett book. It's a very light read, I'll say that. If you've read one Ken Follett book, you've kind of read them all. It just in different circumstances, different settings, different names of people, but it's very much good guys versus bad guys, and good guys win, and bad, the good guys are 100% good, and the bad guys are evil and awful, and you want to see them die. It's a good light read, I would say, if you're, you know, in between two heavier works, this is a good one to read in between, like, say, if you're reading War and Peace or a dense book, and you want to read something else at the same time that's lighter, then, you know, Place Called Freedom is a good read. It, you know, you can predict it from the first page, but ultimately it's a satisfying read and it's, you know, it's competently written and I'm glad I read it. And next we probably have the most influential book that I read this year, that being A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Part of my Road to Ulysses series, which you check out, I have a playlist of it on my channel. I've done Portrait and hopefully by the time I make this video published, I'll have Exiles up as well. But Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man could not have hit me at a better time. I love this book thoroughly. And if you want my thoughts, I did a 35 minute video on Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man, which I researched for two weeks. So watch that, please, because I put so much effort into doing that. And I would recommend, I'd, you know, be very happy if you watched it too. But this is, a, this is an incredible book. I was kind of worried because I bought this book, I did a book haul video on it, and then I just very briefly mentioned offhand that. I want to read Ulysses, and that was basically the center of my comment section was wish me luck for that. So I came up with the idea, why don't I do a series where I read every where I read as much Joyce as possible before I got to Ulysses, and then you know do a Ulysses read along as well. And so I started with Portrait, and you know it kind of dawned on me that maybe like what if I don't like James Joyce? What if, <laughs> like what if I don't like his books and I'm just stuck doing this series? But fortunately, that fear did not come into fruition because. Portrait is an incredible book, and it's a book that you need to read very slowly because he's saying a lot, and it's basically autobiographical, even though the, the main character's name is Stephen Dedalus, but he's basically Joyce at this time, and very, very good. Again, watch that video if you want my full thoughts on it. And it gives you so much good context of Ireland at the time, and how Joyce probably felt of Ireland, which is, you know, it's still under British control, but... There's a lot of desire for home rule. There's a lot of desire for independence completely. And it's all about Stephen Dedalus fighting off, you know, Catholic influences, Irish, national, na Irish nationalism influences. Also, he can pursue his, you know, goal of becoming a writer. And so he literally has to leave the country of Ireland. I recommend it so much for your, anyone who finds this interesting. But again, watch my review if you want my full thoughts on the book. Next up is another Joyce. It's Exiles. It's his only published play. And... Although I did not like it as much as Portrait, I still think that Exiles has a lot to offer. I have a video on that as well, part of my Road to Ulysses, so check that out if you want my full thoughts. But again, somewhat autobiographical at the same time. I'm really starting to get a good feel of what Joyce's, how Joyce's mind works based on what I've read of him so far. And this, you know, really, you know, follows my opinions on him pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well. And... It's very much a modernist play, meaning that if you've read like Doll's House or something like that or any Ibsen play, you'll probably understand this book pretty well, this play pretty well, but it's also a recommendation if you like Joyce, just I would not say this is the first Joyce you should read if you want to get into Joyce. Next up we have The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa, and it's an Italian classic on um, the, the fall of the Kingdom of the Sicilies under the Bourbon rule and the rise of a unified Italy in the 18... Early 1800s to mid 1800s, and my first Italian classic, I think. Yeah, I mean, of you know what, what what we see of Italy today. Yeah, my first Italian classic, and Leopard is Leopard. I did a review on it. It's a masterpiece in my opinion. It's an absolute tragedy that Giuseppe di Lombusa only wrote one novel because this book is incredibly written, and it's almost like the Italian Scott Fitzgerald in a way, where Giuseppe is able to so seamlessly critique the higher class while also not being 100% condescending, while also sort of sympathizing with them at the same time. It's absolutely incredible to see the transition between the King of Two Sicilies to the Italy that we see today, and how it affects a lord, this being the main character being um, Fabrizio Salina, who is a who is a lord under the Bourbon King, and him coming to terms with the fact that his rule is slowly declining to people of what he sees as a lower class. And all that stuff is is really well done. Detail in this book is 
phenomenal. It's top tier, in my opinion. And the character work is top tier as well. Again, if you like Ash Gothic Serial, this is literally the Italian version of that. And if that sounds appealing to you, absolutely read this book. No one's talking about this book, but it is amazing. No one talks about Giuseppe Della Medusa, probably because he only wrote one book, but he's an incredible writer, and it, I really wish there was more of his works for me to read. <laughs> and we have our final Joyce work for today. That'd be Gio Cumlin Joyce, which I was actually at a bookstore with Mark and Tyler, and I found this book on, in the Joyce section behind the bookshelf, covered in dust, and I, I, and I you know, like, it was like finding, like, it's like Indiana Jones finding a treasure, I'm like, what is this book? And it's a collection of manuscript pages from an abandoned work from Joyce that he was writing around the time between Portrait and Ulysses, and ultimately didn't find this book to be worthy of pursuing. And again, like his other works, his autobiographical, and the fact that it's a English teacher in Italy who has an affair with an Italian student of his, and... Again, based off of real events that happened with Joyce as well. And there's not a whole lot to wrap around with this, unfortunately, because it's 16 pages long. But it's more Joyce, which is, you know, can't really, you know, can't really disagree with that. Can't really get mad at that. But I've only read it once, and I'm going to read it again pretty soon because I can just read it in one sitting. But my general impressions are that it's incredibly well written. But again, you just want more. You want, you want to see where the story goes. And I'm very sad at the fact that we could have had the story in, you know, hundreds of pages or so, but we don't have it. And we just have to, you know, press with, you know, the 16 pages that we have. But again, I'd rather, you know, have the 16 pages and not have it at all. And I'll be doing a video on this as well. But as of right now, with my first read, there's not a whole lot I can wrap, you know, it's not a whole lot I can stick my teeth into so far. But, you know, hopefully that will change when I explore it more thoroughly. And, you know, getting towards the end of this list, we have Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And this is my first... Dostoevsky book. I've never read Crime and Punishment before, but I committed myself to reading it from the past month. And again, I briefly mentioned Crime and Punishment in my last video, or two videos ago, depending on when I upload this. But the fact, like me briefly mentioning it, and you know, again, my comments are very much wrapped around the idea that I read it, and everyone's saying it's an incredible book. So I'm going to withhold my thoughts on Crime and Punishment for now until I make a separate video on it. So you will have to watch that as well, because I need the views. So sorry about that, but yeah you'll have to find out what I think about the book in another video. And my second to last book is Guy de Maupassant's collection of short stories. I have never read Guy de Maupassant before, but again, Mark, when we were at a bookstore, threw this in my face, said, Matt, read this book. I'm like, okay. And so I did read it. And it's good. It's a collection of short stories. It's a good night read, I would say, for me. Like, like before I go to bed, I'd like read one short story. Typically, like 90% of these short stories are just like, eight to ten pages so it's a good thing to just read before you go to bed because it's not gonna be too much of a time commitment but Guy's stories <laughs> I call them Guy because we're, because we're like really close friends Montpessant's short stories are they either range from being kind of lighthearted to being absolutely existentially depressing and so just be prepared for that because when you start a short story you're not really gonna know how you're gonna feel at the end of it because there are a lot of short stories where consistently the last line would be laugh because he's very able to have a good punchline to ever to all of his funny short stories but then some of them end on these really like bleak and tragic notes that you finish you're like oh that was rough and again it's kind of like it's like you're playing um a russian roulette with you know these with these short stories you don't know how you're going to feel at the end of it but overall i would say there are, there are a couple misfires in this collection but there are a couple good ones as well that i think make the collection worth reading as a whole i think when his stories get a little bit longer I sort of don't really see the point in them. I feel they're a little unnecessarily long, but the short ones I think are consistently good, and I would highly recommend this if you want, you know, a good nighttime read, a good like wind down read. This is, you know, what you should go for. And last but not least, at least I don't think so because I haven't finished the book yet, but I have Haruki Murakami's Norwegian Wood. I'm only 45 pages into the book, so I can't really say anything about it yet, but within those 45 pages, I've, you know, enjoyed them so far. My first Murakami book I've ever read. Thank you to Tyler of Tyler Talks or Colorless, Wonder or Colorless Wonderland for giving me this book for my birthday. Still wish me birthday on the wrong day, which he has not addressed in his video. So I'm calling you out here, Tyler Talks, Colorless, Colorless World or whatever your name is. Nor <laughs> you did, still have not addressed that, but I do appreciate this book because it's very good. And speaking of that, we will probably be doing a video on Colorless... <laughs> We will probably be doing a video on Norwegian Wood together because he's a Murakami expert. He says he has a master's degree in Murakami, which I think would be kind of weird. I didn't know they, you know, offered classes in that, but that's what he says, and I, you know, believe him 100%. And 
I'm liking it so far, but I can't really commit to any sort of opinions on it yet because, again, you know, I'm like not even a quarter of the way through the book. So, yeah. And that was my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to check out my other videos on my channel. I did a review for Exiles recently as part of the Road to Ulysses series, and I did the review for the Leopard as well, which I think you should watch because a lot of people have not heard of this book. And it's a non spoiler review, so watch it and make sure that you read the book after if it sounds interesting to you because it is a phenomenal book. It is a top tier book. But yes, that's all I have to say for right now. As I said at the beginning of the video, you know, comment what books, you know, comment what books you read. If you've read any of the books that I've read, you know, let me know what you think of them or if you want me to go more in depth into any of the books I've talked about. I will be doing a crime and punishment review at some point, probably, almost certainly, because that got a lot of attraction on my comment section. So I gotta make a video on it. <laughs> and um, I have a lot to say about the book. I'll leave it at that. And yeah, so again, thank you if you made it this far. Let me know what you thought of what I read, what you think that I should read based on my choices right here, based on what I like. Because I do write down, I do have a document where I've written down every recommendation that has been given to me on my comment section. It's, it's on my TBR list, so, and I wrote down who recommended it as well, so I can shout them out if I ever read the books that I do, that they recommended, which I probably will. Just tons of reading, tons of books I already have, tons of books that I wanna own. It's a process. It's so tough to be me. But thank you for making this far, and goodbye.